Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're back with more Fidelity FX Super Resolution 2.0 content following on from yesterday's video looking at image quality in Deathloop. If you did miss that video and want to see how FSR 2.0 compares to native image quality, FSR 1.0 and DLSS, go back and check it out, well worth a watch. What I didn't get time to include in that video was more in-depth testing of FSR 2.0 using a variety of hardware. After all, FSR 2.0 is a widely supported temporal upscaling solution. So we need to see how it performs across a range of hardware, and that's exactly what we'll be doing today. I've tested GPUs from four generations of AMD and Nvidia releases to see how well FSR 2.0 scales on different architectures. As we've discussed in previous videos, FSR 2.0 is a temporal upscaling algorithm that doesn't rely on AI processing, which means it doesn't require dedicated AI acceleration hardware. This means that unlike the AI-based DLSS algorithm, it can work on effectively any modern GPU. AMD's GDC presentation seemed to indicate the algorithm has been designed with the RDNA 2 architecture in mind, but there are various fallback options for other GPUs that don't support the full feature set of the latest architectures, and I'm sure we'll be able to learn more about that when the source code is released soon. We already know that performance on the RDNA 2 based RX 6700 XT is roughly the same as what can be achieved on Nvidia's Ampere RTX 3060 Ti, but what about older GPUs? That's what we're discovering today. For today's testing, I'm using my Ryzen 9 5950X test system equipped with 16GB of low latency DDR4 memory, running the latest publicly available drivers for AMD and Nvidia. Throughout this video, I'll be comparing FSR 2.0 to the next best available upscaling solution for the GPU at hand. So for RTX 20 series cards and newer, I'll be comparing to DLSS and everything else to FSR 1.0. I also want to make a quick note about some of the setting options I've chosen throughout this video. To prevent CPU bottlenecks, I've run Deathloop at the highest feasible quality settings for each GPU, which includes ray tracing enabled on higher end cards. However, Deathloop is a very demanding game on GPU memory, and some of the cards I've tested have only 4 or 6 gigabytes of VRAM, which causes issues on the highest settings and basically bottlenecks the card, meaning we don't see the real benefits of FSR 2.0 or other upscaling algorithms. For those GPUs, I've reduced the settings to an appropriate level that doesn't cause a bottleneck. Anyway, Let's go on with the testing. I'm going to start here with the oldest and slowest card in the lineup, AMD's trusty Radeon RX 570 4GB, which was released way back in 2017. This game struggles to run Deathloop at 1440p using even medium settings, but with upscaling we can get a performance uplift at a minimal cost to visuals. However, unlike with the RX 6700 XT we looked at yesterday, the RX 570 doesn't benefit from FSR 2.0 to nearly as significant of a degree. We do get a performance uplift, but it's just a 10% gain from the FSR 2.0 quality mode, and 27% from the performance mode. It's still worth using in this instance, but not the instant 40% plus gains we saw from the latest architectures. You can also see that FSR 1.0 is indeed faster, which wasn't the case with RDNA 2 either. With the 6700 XT, typically FSR 2.0 quality mode ran better than FSR 1.0 ultra quality, but with the RX 570, it's the less taxing FSR 1.0 that runs a few frames better. However, I'd still recommend using FSR 2.0 here as the visual quality is significantly superior at 1440p. At 1080p, FSR 2.0 was more capable of a performance uplift. The quality mode was giving a 14% boost over native rendering, and the performance mode, which we don't really recommend at this resolution, was 26% faster. This does help the RX 570 achieve an even more playable frame rate, but it's clear the gains from this old, mainstream GPU are quite limited. Another entry-level GPU I tested is a fair bit newer, and that's NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 1650 Super, which is a Turing-based product that doesn't support DLSS as it lacks tensor cores. Like the RX 570 results, the GTX 1650 Super doesn't benefit hugely at 1440p with either FSR 2.0 or 1.0 in this title, and it seems that even medium settings is a bit of a stretch here. The FSR 2.0 quality mode was only 6% faster than native, and the performance mode barely improved upon that. In comparison, FSR 1.0 was able to deliver much better frame rates, with the quality mode there delivering higher FPS than FSR 2.0 performance. However, the gains at 1080p were more acceptable. The FSR 2.0 quality mode was 15% faster than native, similar to what was seen on the RX 570, and the performance mode increased that figure to 
Not earth-shattering results, and FSR 1.0 is definitely faster on this entry-level GPU, but it's usable. I'll be interested to see how budget GPUs like this fare in other FSR 2.0 games to see if it's more of a game thing or more of an FSR 2.0 algorithm thing, but certainly it seems that there just aren't that many GPU resources to go around to run something like FSR 2.0 on this GPU. Let's go back in time to look at FSR 2.0 running on the Radeon RX Vega 64, another 5-year-old product. Using ultra settings at 1440p, FSR 2.0 did provide a modest performance uplift, 25% for the quality mode compared to native rendering, which was enough to take the game up to a 60fps average. Unlike with the entry-level cards we were just looking at, we're back into a situation where the FSR 2.0 quality mode performs better than FSR 1.0 ultra quality, and for that reason FSR 2.0 is definitely the preferred option due to its much better image quality. At 1080p I actually saw less of a gain than at 1440p for FSR 2.0 as it seems like pure shading isn't necessarily the main limiting factor for performance on Vega 64. If shading performance isn't the main bottleneck, then lowering the render resolution may only have limited gains, which seems to be happening here. Other areas to performance, like memory or geometry, could be holding us back from further gains, but either way we still do get a performance uplift. On NVIDIA's Pascal architecture, we see a similar situation to Vega 64. Using ultra settings at 1440p, the GTX 1070 Ti was able to achieve 20% better performance going from native rendering to FSR 2.0 quality, and 41% from using FSR 2.0 performance. FSR 1.0 does perform quite a bit better on this architecture, especially at lower render resolutions, but I'd still prefer to use FSR 2.0 due to its higher image quality. At 1080p, once again, more modest gains of 15% for the quality mode, similar to Vega. It'll be interesting to see how this holds up in other titles, but FSR 1.0 wasn't exactly miles better for something like its ultra quality setting, so I'm still pleased that FSR 2.0 is usable here, and a better option than AMD's older FSR version. Let's take a look at a first generation RDNA product, the RX 5500 XT 8GB model. At 1440p, FSR 2.0 quality mode was able to deliver 24% better performance than native rendering, a much larger uplift than with the RX 570 despite both cards running at approximately the same FPS natively under the conditions we tested. 45% better performance was also possible using the performance mode, and overall this is preferable to FSR 1.0. At 1080p I also saw respectable gains, 21% for FSR 2.0 quality mode and 37% for FSR 2.0 performance, again delivering results that are preferable to using FSR 1.0. Yes, the FSR 1.0 performance setting gives you a few extra FPS, but your eyes won't forgive you for using such a low quality setting. Under the same architecture family, let's now look at the much faster RX 5700 XT. With the same architecture and same memory capacity at hand, FSR 2.0 clearly does benefit from more GPU resources. At 1440p using FSR 2.0 quality mode, we saw a 34% performance uplift, higher than the 24% we saw for the 5500 XT. A larger uplift was also possible for the performance mode, 61% here compared to 45% for entry level RDNA. At 1080p we were able to get a 27% performance uplift compared to native rendering using FSR 2.0 quality mode, and a 44% uplift using the performance mode. With these more mid-range products it really doesn't make sense to use FSR 1.0 as the ultra quality mode runs slower than FSR 2.0 for once again worse image quality. Now let's take a look at Nvidia's Tensor Core equipped Turing architecture starting with the RTX 2060. With this GPU, FSR 2.0 performance is similar to what we saw in yesterday's video with the RTX 3060 Ti, in that DLSS is slightly faster than FSR 2.0 overall, but not significantly so. FSR 2.0 quality mode was capable of a fairly unimpressive 18% performance uplift, but DLSS quality mode only improved that to a 21% gain, so a bit of a much of a muchness here. The best results for DLSS were the performance mode, which ended up 6% faster than the equivalent FSR 2.0 setting. Then at 1080p, similar story, only a 13% performance uplift for FSR 2.0 quality mode compared to native, with DLSS quality mode delivering a 19% uplift. At 1080p, this does make DLSS the favourable option, as it also tends to look better, but neither option is delivering a huge performance increase, though I'd certainly take it if I was struggling to hit a playable frame rate. The most interesting results in my opinion are the RTX 2080 results. 
At 4K, FSR 2.0 was capable of a 26% performance uplift using the quality mode compared to native. However, the gains with DLSS were much larger at 40% for the equivalent mode. On this GPU, DLSS was 10-12% to faster at 4K, which is a significant margin and certainly makes DLSS the favourable option. Again, we don't know how FSR 2.0 works exactly just yet, so we don't know which sort of GPU resources it favours, but I think the results here on the 2080 are a little disappointing, especially when DLSS is very effective. It's a similar situation at 1440p, the performance uplift from FSR 2.0 quality was 18% compared to native rendering, but DLSS quality was achieving a 26% uplift. Not as large of a difference in favour of DLSS, but Nvidia's technique was still around 7% faster overall, so again, for 2080 owners, it would make sense to use DLSS. Lastly, let's take a look at some modern high-end GPUs. At 4K with the RX 6800 XT, FSR 2.0 quality mode was very effective, delivering a 28% performance gain over native rendering. Using the performance mode increased that to 61% over native, and with most modes either matching or beating FSR 1.0, it's clear that on a high-end card like this playing a high resolution, you should be using FSR 2.0. Then for the RTX 3080 using the same settings at 4K, we see a larger gain of 38% for FSR 2.0 quality versus native, and 74% for the performance mode. However, like with other Nvidia GPUs that we've benchmarked, DLSS is the faster option, delivering 4-6% to higher frame rates at the equivalent quality settings to FSR 2.0. So my general thoughts on using DLSS over FSR 2.0 on Nvidia's latest GPUs holds true here. Overall, there's quite a mixed bag of numbers here that vary a lot depending on the GPU in question and its performance. In all situations, it still made sense to use or at least consider using FSR 2.0 as we didn't see performance go backwards and results were generally favourable compared to FSR 1.0 in particular, but there are some instances where gains are smaller than expected. What's clear is that FSR 2.0 runs best on the latest GPU architectures, specifically AMD's RDNA and RDNA2 designs, as well as Nvidia's Ampere. These GPUs consistently delivered the best results in terms of performance uplift compared to native rendering. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect minimum gains of 30-40% to using FSR 2.0 quality mode on these cards, and higher of course using lower modes. However, it's not just the GPU architecture that influences performance. Like we first saw several years ago in testing DLSS, a key component is also the native rendering frame rate. You'll get higher gains if your baseline FPS is lower. This is because FSR 2.0 has a fixed rendering cost, which takes up a larger proportion of the total frame rendering time at higher frame rates. But even if your baseline is 100 FPS or more, FSR 2.0 can still provide solid gains on newer architectures, provided you don't run into CPU bottlenecks. It also seems to be the case that FSR 2.0 runs better on GPUs that are simply faster overall, as we saw comparing the RX 5700 XT and RX 5500 XT. Same architecture, same settings, yet the gains from the 5700 XT were better, despite a higher baseline FPS. This is also what AMD suggested in their presentation, a longer FSR 2.0 processing time for less powerful GPUs. It makes sense that cards with more resources could run the algorithm faster, especially as it doesn't utilize dedicated hardware. When the algorithm is run faster, it uses up proportionally less of the time it takes to render each frame, which can give a performance gain advantage. And this is also relevant for lower end products, especially older GPUs. Cards like the RX 570 and GTX 1650 Super are simply taking longer to process FSR 2.0, which leads to more limited performance uplifts, even in ideal conditions for upscaling. Compounding this are the limitations of older architectures. For example, if parts of FSR 2.0 use FP16 processing like FSR 1.0 does, then the algorithm will have to fall back to FP32 processing on GPU architectures like Polaris that don't natively support FP16, hurting performance. We don't yet have the full picture on what architectural features are necessary for maximum FSR 2.0 performance, but I'd be surprised if FP16 wasn't a factor. Despite this, even 5-year-old GPUs do still run and benefit from FSR 2.0, which you can't say for technologies like DLSS. I'd certainly take a 10 to 20% performance uplift from this temporal algorithm on those cards and would use it over FSR 1.0 despite lesser performance gains. Across the four GPUs we tested that also support DLSS from both the Turing and Ampere generations, 
FSR 2.0 performance does get close to DLSS using equivalent quality settings. However, DLSS typically does run better, up to 12% faster in the best case scenario on the RTX 2080. So for NVIDIA GPU owners with Tensor Core equipped cards, my recommendation would still be to use DLSS, not just for its small performance advantage, but also because in some situations, it does deliver better image quality. And finally, once again, just want to reiterate that this is a sample size of one game. We'll need to do more in-depth testing a few months down the track to see how FSR 2.0 works across a wider range of titles. By then, we should also have FSR 2.0 source code, and hopefully experts in that area can dive in and give us a good picture of what's going on. But for now, we can still learn a bit about the optimal situations for FSR 2.0 in Deathloop, so hopefully this testing has been valuable. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you're interested in supporting Hardware Unboxed and the independent testing that we do, please do consider supporting us on Patreon or Floatplane. Links to those are in the description below. You'll gain access to things like our Discord community, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, all that good stuff. And yes, we probably will be back in a couple of months to check out FSR 2.0 in more games. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.